Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel on migration. Uh, this is Gabriel Finkelstein. I'm the host of the Zoom meeting today. And we have, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is super. I have three of my friends today. Uh, Pamela Kirpius, Hubert Soper, and Ryan Crew. Um, Pam's a former graduate of CU Denver and the founder of Migrants of the Mediterranean, which is a humanitarian storytelling organization. Uh, she'll be our first speaker. Then we have Hubert Soper, who's a, an Academy Award nominated documentary filmmaker who's worked extensively on issues of African and Cuban colonialism. And finally, we have my colleague in the history department, Professor Ryan Crew, who is a professor of Mexican history and global history, as well as the director of social justice program at CU Denver. And I also want to thank his students for allowing us to share his time in his class on the US-Mexican border. So thank you, everyone. I'll be busy um, letting people into the Zoom meeting. And if you have questions, um, please just text them to me. And I'll pose them to our panelists uh, at the end. They're all going to talk 15 to 20 minutes. And at the end, we'll have a sort of general discussion. So uh, thank you, Pam. Let me turn it over to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, um, as well, as Gabriel said, I'm the founder of Migrants of the Mediterranean, which is a humanitarian storytelling organization. What is humanitarian storytelling? Uh, this is really a hybrid of journalism, humanitarian work, and for those in the history department audience here, uh, of oral history. Um, so what uh, what I do is for with migrants of the Mediterranean is uh, document journey stories. So uh, there's actually people here in the audience right now who um, who I follow and write about. Uh, I'm seeing one of them right now, Matar. Um, his story will be upcoming. There he is waving. Uh, yeah. There might be more people who are joining as well. Um, so um, the story for most of the people who I meet. Um, is that they've traveled through Libya after crossing uh, from West Africa or East Africa uh, into Libya, um, where they will all suffer pretty extraordinary human rights abuses. And then after that, they will get pushed out to sea uh, by traffickers on rubber boats, um, and, um, and then they'll be rescued. Um, and one of the places where they'll go for their first reception is a place called Lampedusa. Lampedusa is actually part of Italy, but it's closer to Libya and Tunisia. So for that, when people are getting rescued, it's oftentimes like the first place that they'll be taken to. This is the place where I, in years past, have uh, uh, kept myself to greet people. So when people like Matar or others who arrived, I would be there to say, hello, how are you? And, uh, and greet them and record their story for the historical record. And this is the point, um, is to make sure that not just that we're connecting as human beings, and this is something that's lacking in that reception process too, um, but to greet people, one another, see each other on equal terms and make each other feel welcome in those early moments, especially. And, um, and then, you know, for a more complete historical record, actually getting down these stories of where did you come from? How did you, how did you get here? What happened during that time? And when did you arrive? So, so this is what each of the stories on the story archive encompass. Um, and you'll see most people are coming from West Africa, Gambia, Nigeria, Senegal, other countries in, the, in that general area. Though we've had people, as I said, from all over. So, um, so that is the work that we do. Uh, and then after, I first, after I meet people and get those first journey stories, they have my contact information. And if they wish uh, to stay in touch, many of them do, 
um, you know, they'll just text me here on WhatsApp and um, I'll go to them in their housing camps wherever they are across Italy. Um, and then I follow them through the asylum process um, and everything else that happens in daily life there. Are you learning the language? Are you making friends? Are you working? If you're working, do you have a contract for your work? Um, lots of issues like this come up. Uh, and so, and that's where more like the journalistic aspect comes in where I can actually report on the ground from these places that can sometimes be hard to get to. Um, still always giving uh, a voice to the people who need it most because they are extraordinarily marginalized where they are. Um, you know, oftentimes when they're in these holding patterns at their, in their housing camps uh, within the asylum process, it can take years of, of sitting by waiting. Um, and so this does something to the human spirit to be stuck in a place um, where things are unfamiliar, where maybe you're not really integrating. You still don't have documents to even legally stay in the country, just a, a temporary stay permit uh, until you know, your asylum case is actually heard. Uh, so this is the course of the work of humanitarian storytelling and migrants of the Mediterranean. Now, I think, uh, and Gabriel, you could kind of like just uh, start the dialogue here with me at this point, but I wanted to say that, you know, for the people who were in the history audience, I had no intention of doing this and it is, but it is actually something that is like perfectly applied history and, um, and, and so, the, you know, if there's a lot, if there's any questions about what you can do with a history degree, well, I think you can do actually anything you want is the short answer to that, anything. Um, I, for example, even before I started doing the work I'm doing right now in the humanitarian and journalism field, I was in advertising. I still do freelance advertising. Uh, and I can tell you that there is a great, it's a great value for to come to even that corner of the, the market having an understanding of something else beyond uh, the immediate scope of things. Um, it helps to have a perspective and history allows you to have a perspective. It allows you to place yourself in something that's much larger than just yourself. So a history degree to me is invaluable and you can do really anything. Um, so uh, actually, I think um, I'm gonna stop right here because there's a lot of information just about the work um, and, and the people. And I think as we start to talk and have a conversation more of that will come out. Um, but uh, before we go on to anyone else, Gabriel, is there anything that you would want me to convey to the students or Ryan also to convey to your students um, about the work? Um, I mean, I'm curious how you first got involved in your organization. What inspired you to do it? What experiences did you have led you to it? Yeah, well, um, it was totally by accident. I, um, I had traveled in Italy a lot and, um, and I continued to. And finally, uh, when I was traveling through Sicily, I noticed um, the island of Lampedusa. And I knew this island actually because right around the time that I graduated from CU Denver, um, I was at a film festival where I saw a movie called Respiro, which is an Italian movie that's shot on the island there. So this was my understanding of Lampedusa for years, for almost 15 years, but I had no sense of really where it was, you know, and, and if you look for it on the map, you will do be zooming in and zooming in, zooming in until you finally find it because Lampedusa is actually 20 square kilometers. It's not, I mean, even the Islanders themselves call it just a rock in the middle of the sea. So uh, this is it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so when I was traveling and looking at the map further and to say, well, I wanna go somewhere that's off the beaten path. I started, I noticed this place and I was like, aha, that's from that movie, let's do it. Well, of course, once I got into, once I started doing that, I started to become more familiar with what was actually taking place on the island. And, um, and when I arrived, it was just, I think it was just a week after the Brexit vote. So all of this was in the air, all of this like fear of the outsider was in the air. You know, Trump had not been elected yet, but the specter of him was like looming for sure. And so all of this was kind of like charged in the air when I got there. And then on my first day there at this central beach where, you know, I was there with mostly Italian tourists, which are 
primarily the people who will go to Lampedusa in the summertime. Um, it's not really known outside of Europe, I think much at all. <laughs> but, uh, in, 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 within Europe, I'm, I suspect there are more people who do know about the island. In any case, you know, it's a tourist destination in the high season. So there's the umbrellas and the loungers and there's the bar and you can take your cafe and you can do, you know, it was a vacation. But on this beach, um, people who had just arrived, um, who were rescued, um, were not allowed to come down onto the beach proper. They were ushered by the police to the rocks that were adjacent to this in this cove. And so in this moment, we are totally segregated from one another. And this was done, you know, basically for business purposes. They didn't want to disrupt tourism when this humanitarian crisis was unfolding literally right before us. And uh, that was it. That was it. And I think um, I think almost everyone will uh, will understand uh, that feeling of wanting to be a part of something that's bigger than you. And I think I had spent the whole of my life until that point wondering when this moment was going to come along and kind of hit me over the head that was going to pull me in to say, this was the thing you're supposed to be doing. This is where you are needed. And, um, and I, and that was it. I was, I've never seen anything so, um, uh, you know, acutely uh, segregated like that. You know, we have obviously issues like this in the United States still. Um, I used to live in Chicago, for example, north side, south side, very segregated city. Philadelphia is the same way, North Philly and West Philly. Um, you know, so, uh, but, but this is institutionalized in this way that makes you feel like you're not really accountable although you are, of course. Um, but in this moment on this beach, it was right there. I mean, people said, they said, no, you have to come over here. And this didn't resonate. This didn't set well with me. So um, it was bas basically an, an obsession after that. I went back to the island three more times um, between July and November, 2016 um, to investigate as much as I could about what life was like there, what was going on there, um, how um, people were being managed when they arrived, mostly from a border control perspective. I spoke to a lot of people in Coast Guard and military. Um, and then of course, locals who would orient me also to you know, what life was like there. Um, but what was missing from the first two trips was actually speaking to people, people like Matar and um, other people who I hope are joining us as well, uh, who, um, you know, who had actually taken the journey and who were actually suffering in Libya and who actually crossed the Mediterranean on a rubber raft. And um, it was then in speaking to them that everything shifted. Um, it was no longer about just tr like writing an article, which was my initial intent was to just write an article about a New Yorker on Lampedusa Island, uh, you know, and, and and talking about this this place, that was both that was both uh, enchanting and also um, disturbing, and um, and and so and so that was it. Once I began talking to the first person, his name is Felix. He was from the Gambia, is from the Gambia. Um, that was it. It was all. And then it was all about him. And, and, and this and his story, it was so clear that nobody knew the details of his journey. And I thought, uh, I didn't think actually, just in the moment I started recording them, I started interviewing people on the island in November, 2016. And it was one day after the presidential election in 2016 that I arrived. So it was a perfect response also to what was going on with the, this anti-immigration candidate where you know now I could actually be there actively working against a policy I didn't believe in. Um, that was kind of serendipity in a way, I didn't expect that, um, but that's history and um, and this is it. Uh, and after that, I just continued to go back to the island for um, periods of field work, uh, months at a time, staying on the island. Um, and then now that things have shifted so much on the island from a place of reception uh, to basically being a place that's really closed down, there are still arrivals on Lampedusa, but ports are more or less closed and uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated this as well. So um, now I'm better served actually out in the field in Italy like the, in the mainland. So the people who I met now four and a half years ago, I can go to them in Rome, Naples, Milan, wherever they are in Sicily or further north um, and continue writing their stories. And, um, and that's, um, 
and this is how I got involved. <laughs> yeah, totally by accident, not with a human rights background or international policy background or anything like this, just an interest in um, uh, doing something that was much larger than myself that was actually a part, you know, being a part of history, I think. Do you think, um, well, do you think Matar might be willing to um, share anything with uh, the audience today? Um, let me just ask him right now. Matar, you're there. Would you feel comfortable speaking at all right now? Um, yeah, hello. My name is Matar, and I will just um, like to, you know, I'm from the Gambia, and sorry everyone that you know my english is not no. too good Perfect. but i will try to explain you know i left gambia um 2014 and you know from gambia then i decided to go to libya then i passed through senegal then mali then um niger it's okay, all like yeah. africa and then you know i passed also through the desert then I went to Libya. When you crossed, so in Libya, and let, uh -huh. me, let me just uh, like interview okay. you a little bit here, Matar. When you crossed the the desert, how did you cross? Were you in a truck? Were you in a car? How many people were with you? Um, actually, when I was um, in Niger, you know, there I was with um, many people, mm -hmm. and you know, all different nationality from different countries in Africa. Yeah. And, you know, there, you know, you have to meet like the smugglers, you know, because yeah. um, like, you know, in order to get to Libya, you need like visa. But, you know, when you want to take the bag way, you, you need to um, pay the smugglers yeah. money. Yeah. So they will um, take you to pass through the desert by truck or either you can also take by car. But, you know, on my side, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I went with, you know, um, let's say it was 30, yeah, yeah, 35 people, but in a truck, mm -hmm. 35 people in a truck. And when you say the truck, it also, so people know, understand, it's, it's the back of like the pickup truck. So you have the cabin up front and then there's the back. And in that back, there'll be like 30, 35 people, you said, who are crammed in there. Sometimes their yeah. legs are dangling over the side or did you have the stick that you were holding on to, Matar? Yeah, exactly. You know, like, you know, it was a truck. No, sorry. It was uh, like a pickup. Yeah. And we were at 35. Yeah. So five people are inside the car, the truck, not the pickup. And then you have 30 people on the back of the pickup. Mm -hmm. And then each of us, we have like a stick that, yeah. you know, you know, 30 people um, behind the pickup. Right. So we have to be there and it was too, you know, unsafe. Just steady. So everybody understands they, they have like a stick that they'll kind of like hold down onto the base of the, the back of the truck. So when you're exactly. like going over this bumpy road in the desert, you have something to hang on to. Because if you fall off, a lot of the times the traffickers will leave you behind. Yeah, exactly. Even sometimes, you know, you, you, know, you get some people fall down. Yeah. But then, you know, um, there um, we are grouped, but then if you fall down, sometimes you get to hurt yourself. Even you can, lo you can um, lose your life there. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, because um, for me, I had no problem, you know, I, at least I was safe, you know, I reached to Libya without problem. But also I see some people, you know, who, you know, they even lose their life, mm -hmm. you know, you Seeing know, because they fall down. Very common, yeah. And then the problem is that if you fall down, you know, the, the driver don't stop, you know, they keep going, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, you have to be there. And then, you know, during the way also, you see like some other trucks or pickups, they have like accident mm -hmm. or, or, you know, also inside the, in the desert also, you have some like criminals groups right. that, you know, they stop their, your pickups and they ask also money for you. Right, they'll rob you um, very frequently. Yeah, There's, yeah, and, yeah. And, so, and to just uh, cut in one more time, Matar, just to orient people further. And, and also to tell everyone, I'll, send, I'll add a link to the chat here shortly too, so you can go to the site and read the stories. 
what he's telling you about what's happening in the desert is something that everybody in these stories has encountered. So you'll find that in the storytelling across the Sahara. There are this many people there. They had this much water. Maybe they saw an accident and people were, you know, had died. Maybe they saw a mass grave, all sorts of things. So, but, uh, but yes, as uh, Matar was telling us, there are, there's checkpoints all through the Sahara. So when you leave from Agadez, Niger, which is a big, uh, jumping off point until you okay. get usually around Saba, I think is where most people will go first, Mita, Saba yeah. in Libya. Yeah. Uh, it's this, it's just a long stretch of precarity. You know, you, you, everything is unsure. Um, so you'll be stopped and robbed if you have any extra money or resources on you, like a phone. I, you know, at that point, I'm not sure how many people have phones, but things like this will be taken. Um, and, and, and of course the most pressing thing um, before, um, I, before I uh, stop us together, Matar, for um, in one more minute to let the next speakers go and then we'll continue our conversation here is um, water. When you're in the Sahara and you're leaving for uh, in the back of that truck, um, water is very scarce, isn't it? There's not very much of it. You mean like if, if, do, if we have water with us or? Yeah, like water to drink so you can survive. Yeah, like, you know, when we, uh, we are in the um, truck, we, we have like, you know, one, um, like, let's say um, one liter of each mm -hmm. of us water that sometimes, you know, you use to drink. Mm -hmm. And then also you have also a small little food with you. Right. That if you're hungry, then, then you, can, you can also eat. And also, so everybody is clear, um, we're talking one liter of water, you said you had, with you and the journey through the desert tends to be around a week. It's usually around four to seven days on average. It can go longer, it can go shorter depending. Matar, it, um, it, quickly before it, we go on to the next, how long was your journey across the desert? Um, actually, my journey across from Akades to, um, to Saba, it takes me four days. Four days, okay, that's pretty average, yeah, yeah. It takes yeah. me four days. And, but what really sad is that, you know, on the, um, in the desert, you know, you got to um, find people that they stock, really stock there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, you know, even, you know, when you pass through, like, you know, um, in my truck, you know, I was lucky that we took four days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on the desert, sometimes we stop and then we get to eat. Mm -hmm. So we see some people that, you know, they cannot make it at all. And, you know, the, our drivers wouldn't let them to get in inside our truck. So, you know, these people, sometimes they write a letter, maybe they give it to you. If you go to, if you read to Libya, mm -hmm. maybe um, just um, try to call my family, tell them that, you know, I'm here, stuck okay. here. So, which is like very sad also. Yeah. Wow. Mm. That's, I mean, that's a great note to point it's, out. It's, Thank you, Matar. Mm, Matar, yeah. I have to stop us right now for a moment while we go on to... Uh, mm -hmm. Hubert and, uh, and Ryan, um, and then we'll have a chance, both of us also after that to speak more and answer questions, okay? Yeah, thank okay. you, Pamela. Thanks thank for- you, Pamela, and thank you, Matar. That was a moving story, a sad and moving story, but thank you for sharing it. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, sorry that, you know, my English, you know, right. it's really clear. Yeah, it's great, know. it's great, Matar. Good. Okay, Hubert. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, you're muted, sir, Hubert. Who? <laughs> Hubert is, is, Hubert is, is muted. Salam alaikum. <laughs> you should say malaikum salam. Ah. Malaikum salam. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you, sir. Um... um do, should I, uh, yeah. should I talk, uh, Gabriel, or, or uh, yes, yes. But well, thank you, everyone, to have me on board. Uh, Gabriel, thank you for for getting this, uh, getting us together. I, I I have to say one word about Gabriel is an old friend, uh, very inspiring person, and all my films, because I'm a film director, are in a way. Um, accompanied by by many friends but uh, 
uh, Gabriel is one of the most inspiring of my friends when it comes to big stories from my starting movies. Anyway, um, thank you, Pamela, also for your talk. I um, <clears throat> I have to say first, um, I I have a very very odd life and a very privileged life, um, and I work with uh, with with a universal language, which is uh, moving images. I'm a film director. Um, the story of uh, moving images is about 120 years old. And that story literally changed the world in a, in a way that is, is not uh, thinkable. And it's the theme of my latest film called Epicentro, which was uh, last year in Sundance. Um, and uh, and one grand award by the way in Sundance. So it was the last time I was in the USA because then the uh, <clears throat> COVID came along. So at, at, at this point, I'm a filmmaker, a cinema maker, and there are no cinemas in the world, which is a very odd thing. So, but I have to, uh, I want to, I want to explain you a little bit um, what is my connection to the theme we're talking about tonight. Um, <clears throat> why I got interesting interested in, in, in what what is what is it what could it be to be a refugee it has to do with my uh, upbringing in a, in a in a place where I I kind of uh, grew up in a place where I thought I I cannot exist there anymore it was a small village in <clears throat> in the Austrian mountains in the Alps. I grew up in the 70s and um, that was not very long from from the end of uh, World War II. It's only uh, 30 years down the road. And uh, many grown-ups around me when I was a kid and a young, a young person were also um, uh, active participants in the Third Reich. So, uh, the Third Reich uh, officially ended in 1945, uh, but it didn't end uh, in its uh, in its you know demonic uh, energy and in, in its in its uh, narrative. So, so many people around me were, um, to make a long story short, old Nazis, and I. Um, I had the chance, or, or, or maybe if you call it, you can call it a chance that I, I, I feel like I, I, I lived uh, the, I saw the the, 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 the ugly face and the demons of the Third Reich, of the Nazi Germany, and Austria, by the way, uh, because because uh, you know Berlin was denazified in in forty five and. Uh, some remote places like Lampedusa or <laughs> remote islands or uh, remote valleys in in the mountains, uh, you know, kind of retained this old spirit. So I ran away. I ran away when I was 18. So I was de facto a, a political refugee, <clears throat> not uh, received by the UNHCR, but I ran. And um, I, I now live for the last 35 years in, in Many different countries, even in the USA, um, uh, for a little while when I was twenty. But um, for some strange um, series of events, uh, the first film, as a film student, uh, the first real film, let's say, uh, by the end of my film studies, was already in Africa, and I, I kind of came across almost unwantingly uh, with refugees all the time. And it's like something you are, uh, you know, uh, it's like when, you, when you're when you sensibilized on something, you, you, you tend to meet it. So, and I, I ended up um, trying to make a, a movie about a film with a small H high eight uh, video camera which was a new thing uh, 22 years ago, or 25 years ago. It was very new that you could carry like your own gear and make, make actually a movie <clears throat> um, in very remote places. And, uh, and I 
came to the east of the Congo, trying to film um, a few refugees that had made it out of out of Rwanda after the genocide of '94. And um, um, I was with the UNHCR, with the Organization of, uh, of Refugees for, from the UN, um, and the UNHCR were planning to repatriate a few remaining Rwandans who had been running through the through the rainforest of the Congo away from the from the genocide. And uh, as I'm there with my with my partner Susanna, who is a, a musician from from Hungary, um, the the civil war in the Congo breaks out, and uh, and the few Rwandan refugees turns out to be a few hundred thousand. And they are essentially being slaughtered in the midst of the Congolese civil war. Now I'm talking about March and April, 1997. Then I made this first movie, it's called Kisangani Diary. Kisangani Diary is, is, is kind of a film about refugees, but uh, the truth is it's, it's, a, it's a film about a genocide that I never, I kind of wished I'd never seen in my life. I was never, planning and I didn't actually go there to see a genocide. I was, uh, I came or it came uh, upon me like a, like a ter terrible thing. But the, the good thing that now so many years back is that I, first of all, that I could witness it what I saw with a small camera. And, and the other thing is that I, I, I understood that that genocide is is very very much a part of our civilization and of many civilizations the last let's say ten thousand years I would say and um, either you see it or or not either you want to see it or not but it is a reality and it's it's an ongoing reality so so um, I have the privilege to be able to not only see the world, but uh, express it. So uh, my impressions are becoming expressions in their cinema movies. Um, and um, I, from that movie, Kisangani Diary, uh, from then on, this is uh, 97, is 24 years ago. Um, I have not spent one single day that I haven't been thinking of that event. Um, and there is not one single scene in any of my films that is not politically or socially or, or um, in, uh, engaged. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in this, and I'm actually very, uh, I feel very privileged. And um, <clears throat> I also have a, an amazing chance that I, I'm a, a European film. Uh, maker and uh, in Europe uh, it's called uh, cinema cineaste d'auteur uh, film artist and I and I, I get uh, granted uh, quite substantial amounts of money for my films um, that allow me to uh, work like five seven three four five seven years at the most uh, the one film that was the longest was called we come as friends and it's, uh, I worked for seven years in this one film um, that movie, We Come As Friends, um, that I feel that was also in Sundance, also won in Sundance, by the way. Um, it, um, it is essentially depicting the, the root course, the root cause of uh, why our friend that we just heard talking had to cross the, the desert. Um, when you ask refugees in, in Europe, it's why, why are you here? Is it like, because we didn't have any food, because um, there was war, I had to run uh, for my life. Um, but of course, behind that story is always another story, and behind that is another story. Um, I mean, the European-African dialectic is, is a few hundred years old, but there's one event in history that kind of kicked in um, something that we are now... Uh, you know, trying to sort out, and we cannot sort it out. That is the Berlin conference when the Europeans divided Africa into into little pieces like a cake uh, in 1885, uh, I think. 
Gabriel, is that true? Yeah. Um, with, uh, with Bismarck in Berlin, anyway. So the Europeans who had never set foot except one or two people, I think uh, Morton Stanley uh, was there, who had been in Africa, but 99% but of all these people who divided Africa had never set foot in Africa. Uh, and that division and subsequent uh, colonization, colonization by Christ Christian missionaries, colonizations by by fanatics in 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 in, 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 in many ways, uh, uprooted uh, the whole continent, Africa, and uh, and disintegrated uh, structures, and uh, and Africa has been since bleeding literally, uh, resources, um, human resources, uh, and uh, knowledge um, until this day. And um, just to make a, an arc to, to my latest film, um, some Europeans, you know, became Americans and uh, fought against the uh, colonialists, fought against the Brits and uh, became independent, you Americans. Uh, it's a big party, Independence Day, but also uh, very quickly afterwards, the U.S. decided to actually not uh, not just celebrate uh, the liberation of colonizers, but also to become colonizers. And that's the story of my latest film. It's called Epicentro, and the decision that uh, the USA would become um, uh, a power very similar to the European powers that would project force uh, would uh, suck resources from the South would um, dominate militarily and economically the South, which is in, in, in the American case, uh, the Caribbean, Latin America, and then and the Pacific. Um, that was uh, decided um, in the 1850s or something. And uh, in 1898, you know, the story maybe Americans know is uh, it came to the Spanish-American War, where the US uh, decided to kick out uh, the last European power, which was the, was the Spaniards, uh, big success, Teddy Roosevelt. And, uh, and then three years later, the Panama Canal was digged and, uh, and the domination of the Pacific and, and the Caribbean um, became reality and very similar to the European. And that's why now, yeah, also very, very similar, uh, people have to cross the, the Latin, the Central America and the Rio Grande. Um, and the wall is not going to stop that because it's, it's only we're only starting to see that happening. But um, um, very, it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to kind of understand these complex stories, and I I, I don't claim to understand it. I, I just know that I have a, a very very specific position in our society is that I. I have enough means to, uh, you know, spend years in the Sudan and and uh, kind of figure out something that we have to figure out as a society. And not only I can kind of figure out things, I'm not saying that I find the truth, of course, but I figure out some things and I put some elements of a puzzle together and it's called a movie and it and it's kind of like a, chemistry and, it, and, it, and when you get the right few elements together it, it, it blows up into the minds and souls of of uh, millions of spectators which is amazing so um yeah uh, I, I i can of course uh, elaborate a lot more but uh, maybe that's enough as an introduction maybe i can just mention you know people don't know my face so much but um my most known work is called uh, Darwin's Nightmare. It's, it's, a, it's a movie <clears throat> that has also to do with the same uh, story that is trying to depict the, uh, the root course of uh, globalization going, going berserk. And it's shot, it's about the arms trade, it's about refugees too, and it's about uh, um, the, uh, the perverted narrative of Europeans that is necessary to be able to keep the crime going, you know, because then the, the, the narrative is the most interesting thing. It's not that Europe is exploiting Africa 
uh, that's not interesting. It's just a fact and it's sad, but nobody thinks that's interesting. But what is interesting is how it is packaged, how it is, uh, how it is uh, sold. And uh, it is sold by, you know, we have to help those poor people. We have to send them food and clothes. They are naked. And uh, so, you know, but why do we have to dress up people who are naked? It's because we need to make little soldiers out of people who, to guard our pipelines, you know, because naked people make no sense for the, for the colonial, colonialist's mind. Um, and and it f into that feeds this like uh, this pathological you know you know avalanche of 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 of, <clears throat> of ever perpetrating uh, um, stories you know like the the, the 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 in the north it's the light the white man is uh, is intelligent uh, black people are, are, are less hygienic all this narrow I mean there's it, it, it still it still um, kind of resonates in, in in thousands of programs. Nobody in Europe says you know uh, people should wash themselves because they're they're Congolese. But 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 NGOs would say we have to start a program for bettering hygiene. <laughs> you know? so so the the narrative is 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 perverted and. Uh, in a way, fantastic too, because that's, I mean, I'm just I'm describing it in my movie. Fantastic in, the, in, a, in a sinister sense, of course. Anyway, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to talk also more specifically about uh, the Mediterranean uh, situation, because I also know a very, very close and very personal friend of mine are, are exactly in that, uh, have been in this situation, have been crossing in a rubber boat, as uh, Pamela explained. Um, and all of them have similar, similar stories, stories of hardship, of, of um, injustice, uh, of unbearable, uh, you know, kind of uh, human condition. But what is more un unbearable is, is to, if you understand the, a bigger context, and if you know that they are there because Chevron invested into some, you know, fucking pipeline that crosses the Chad and Sudan. Just an example. Yeah. And if I can throw in a few words, is that all right? Sure. Um, great. I was just going to say to, um, and I know with Epi, uh, I'm saying epicentral with an Italian accent, epicentro, <laughs> I can't help it. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, for all of the geographical areas beyond the Mediterranean too, there's so many parallels in all of the stories. So, you know, for example, I'm actually in Arizona right now. And so the Sonoran Desert is just behind me over this direction. And uh, after spending a bit of time, even at the border, also there um, in Nogales and um, also in the Operation Streamline um, Courthouse in Tucson, where people are getting deported at a mass scale, um, if they're not held in prison, that is. Um, uh, the parallels in the stories are the same. You just have to swap out uh, the desert with the sea. And um, instead of a trafficker um, in the Sahara, it will be uh, the cartels that are running people through the desert and across the border from Mexico. So, um, and I'm sure also Hubert, um, for all of the other areas you've been to, there's you know the same sorts of parallels in those stories. Well, that Pamela is a perfect transition to our last panelist, uh, who's my colleague, uh, Ryan Crew. Uh, Ryan, can you hear me? Uh, yes. <laughs> OK. Well, there you go. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, and thank you, uh, Pamela. It's great to meet you. Uh, we haven't met in person, but thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Yeah. And thank you, Matar, for your words. Um, and uh, and we can all um, discuss all of this in a moment. And thank all of you for coming. Um, 
benvenuti a tutti in Italia. Yeah, buonasera. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have kind of a transatlantic uh, uh, gathering here to discuss this. Um, and uh, we are all in through Zoom uh, in a transatlantic classroom of sorts. Um, because this is my normal uh, history of the US-Mexico borders. We have our students here with us too um, at CU Denver here with us. So thank you very much, all of you. Um, I just have some comments to, to pull all, all of this together. You know, what, what historians do, um, what social scientists do, um, primarily, fundamentally rely on narratives like, um, like the one that, that Matar has, has told us, right? And it relies on the work of people like Pamela, um, collecting, um, archiving, synthesizing uh, the testimonies and narratives, um, in this case of, of migrants, of the experiences, of the stories that have been marginalized, and silenced in so many ways. Um, so my comments here um, are kind of looking at from the perspective of, of a historian, right? What a, what a, what a historian does. Um, and so it's reflections on, on the present events um, and also the, the, how we have arrived here, right? Um, so as we can connect these uh, stories of migration uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, and here I wanna connect them with those of the US-Mexico borderlands where Pamela is uh, right now in Arizona. Uh, for me, two scenes that I witnessed in 2018 especially come to mind. In the summer of 2018, I was visiting Noto, a lovely hill town in the southeast corner of Sicily. And again, it was just vacation, right? Um, and I stepped inside that town's Baroque cathedral um, and was immediately transported back uh, to the subjects that I study and that I teach, yeah? uh, to Mexico and borderlands with the United States. Uh, right there in front of me was a cross made of damaged curving wooden planks their fading blue and white paint showing a long time in salt water. Um, I'm standing before La Croce de Barconi, the cross of the migrant boats. A local, a local artist and activist, Elia Lijoy, uh, had gathered the wreckage of migrant boats along the Sicilian coastline. And he built this monument to the many lives lost at sea. Of Eritreans, Somalis, Cameroonians, Sudanese, and many others who found themselves compelled to leave their homes and risk their lives to risk everything to reach safety in Europe. Now, go back in time a little bit, some months earlier, I was in Tijuana on a new pedestrian bridge returning to the US at the Garita del Chaparral. From that elevated position, I could see below the concrete bed of the Tijuana River where several hundred makeshift tents were stretched along the river. For several weeks, Mexican police had been preventing migrants seeking asylum in the United States from even approaching the US border. Down below, several small campfires burned. And not more than 500 feet away, so about uh, 200 meters or so, um, up an embankment and on the other side of two razor wire fences that marked the US-Mexico border, there was an H&M store gleaming in the night, humming away with holiday music and fren frenzied shopping. Though at opposite ends of the earth, the Croce in Noto and the encampment in Tijuana, in my opinion, both form part of an expanding 21st century border regime. To, bar to borrow the words of Shishek, this is a socially mediated catastrophe. The deadly result of accumulated histories of inequality, crass political calculations and nationalist sentiments. A border is not natural. It is socially created, and when it systematically kills day after day, it is because the society that has invested in it has willed it so. This is most visible in the refugee camps at the edge of the border's most perilous passages, in Tijuana and Izmir, in Tobruk and Tripoli, Ceuta and Tangier, uh, Tangier Reynosa and Nogales. The camps are not the unavoidable result of caravans or just crowds. They're the consequence of border policies that have weaponized geography itself, corralling migrants towards the most dangerous passages into the open sea or into the driest deserts of Arizona. In these lethal boundary zones, the migrant is stripped of protection, 
a border patrol agent can simply empty the water a Samaritan had left for her and her companions in the sand, or an Italian interior minister can forbid the vessel that rescued her from landing at the nearest safe, at the safest nearby port. Inside the societies that these measures allegedly protect, the discourse of border security or immigration control swiftly devolve into a far right ethos that naturalizes the idea of the border as a mortal field of deterrence. Matteo Salvini and Joe Arpaio, Donald Trump and Viktor Orban, Stephen Miller and Nigel Farage, to name just a few, have recently made this thinking into something of a transnational crusade. And all the while, we find too many graveyards to count, from the waters off Lampedusa to the most recent massacre just two weeks ago in Tamaulipas in northern Mexico which claimed 19 more souls at the hands of state police. This is a border regime that seems to relish the idea of the accident or the luck of one's birth, a kind of 21st century theory of predestination that governments underwrite with more cement, more wire and more patrols. So in the face of this dehumanization, what is the role of the humanities, of historians? I would argue, that surely it is to provide the, the tools to engage in a withering critique of this social catastrophe, to expose the lies and malevolent assumptions that uphold myths of superiority, and to question the absurdity that a frontier should ever serve as the primary solution for arranging the relations between nations or between the life of a person that a wall claims to protect and that of the person who is compelled to try and cross it at such immense danger. For people familiar with the United States-Mexico border politics, the scenes that began to appear in the Mediterranean some two decades ago were immediately recognizable. In 1999, makeshift rafts, known as pateras in Spanish, began to make headlines as unprecedented, unprecedented numbers of Moroccans and sub-Saharan Africans sought to cross the Straits of Gibraltar. And the Spanish Guardia Civil began to make grim rounds on the Spanish coastline to arrest those who survived the perilous nighttime crossing and to collect those who didn't. Some five or six years later in the waters between Tunisia and Lampedusa, similar scenes repeated and continued every summer since. And since 2011, we've seen, of course, the Syrian crisis produce a similar bottleneck in the waters off Greece and Turkey. For those of us over here in North America, these scenes were called tragedies that had already, already taken place. We were over here quite literally watching history repeat itself. Just as in the United States' southern borderlands, once again, the failures of politics to, adru to address root causes, the maddening complexity of visa processes and physical walls all rooted migrants towards these tragedies. In some ways, the US-Mexico border foretold the contemporary Mediterranean tragedy. Over here, already for more than a century now, the elements of the 21st century border regime have been building in the US-Mexico borderlands. Now, of course, this is not to say that migration started recently in the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a very long story as well. But in the US-Mexico borderlands, already a century ago, anti-immigrant politics and white supremacy spurned a violent border vigilantism. Fences went up patrols and militias deployed, Mexican migrants in El Paso were being treated like vectors of disease. Asians, who US policies and patrols particularly targeted, paid smugglers to bring them, bring them through the same desert passages where Central Americans risk everything today. Domestic debates raged in the United States regarding the economic value of immigration and the possibilities or likelihood of assimilation. Racists and nationalists portrayed the newcomer as an invader and their stigmatizing rhetoric created an environment in which immigrants labored in fear for artificially low, wa low wages. And just in this brief list here, I haven't even reached the year 1925. Over here, this is already in some key ways an old story, a hundred years of crisis. Histor historical perspective then offers us vital insights. It reminds us to question the alleged novelty of the present crisis and to resist facile assumptions that the roots of all this lie solely in contemporary globalization. Today's paths of migration are already well trodden. In what is now the US-Mexico borderland, migration out of central Mexico by peoples of all backgrounds 
began after the discovery of silver in Zacatecas in 1545. The Chicano historian Rodolfo Acuña aptly called these northern paths of emigrants the corridors of migration. These northward journeys were as constitutive of the United States as any westward voyage from Europe. And of course, if we turn to the Straits of Gibraltar or the seas between Sicily and Tunisia, there were centuries of movements in both directions, we all know, of refugees, conquerors, migrants, and cultures. So in the long view, the Bredellian view, uh, these historical relations are about as easy to arrest as it would be to control the currents of the sea itself. Along these paths traveled the causes and roots of our present global crisis. Colonialism, dependent development, and neocolonialism moved along these circuits be long before mass migration. In 20th century Latin America, just to give an example, economic development unfolded with limited options. The cases of Guatemala, Chile, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, where the United States violently intervened, marked the limits of autonomous economic decisions. But less explosive interventions caused equal destruction. In Mexico, the neoliberal reforms carried out alongside NAFTA, the free trade agreements between the United States and Mexico, decimated the Mexican countryside and uprooted millions of rural people in the 1980s and 90s. Where could they go? In Central America, current crises forcing people to risk a dangerous journey north are rooted in US policies in that region. In the North, in the Norte, in the United States and Europe, nationalists prefer to cover the tracks of these histories. It's far more effective to silence the past and simply claim that what we see unfolding before us is new, dangerous, unprecedented. Even while we deepen our understanding of how we arrived here though, we must also recognize how quickly histories that were once regional in scope are intertwining, expanding, and globalizing as, as Pamela has just very well stated. Take, for example, the story of what we know in the United States as border security. The whole complex of patrols, detention systems, and deportation methods. In one form or another, the United States Border Patrol has existed since 1883 when Congress created the patrol to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Act along the Mexican border. Since then, border enforcement has been expanding its purview. Together with the Texas Rangers, the force formed part of the racial violence in Texas during the 1920s and carried out mass deportations of Latin Americans in the 1920s, the 50s, and of course, very recently in recent waves under Obama and Trump. Today, ICE's jurisdiction covers most of the US, effectively rendering this whole country a gigantic border. And the United States is now exporting this legacy. ICE now trains border forces around the world in the Dominican Republic and the Philippines, for example, ICE agents train immigration police in tracking migrants, detention methods, and deportation. And while this border security complex globalizes, so also the roots of refugees are also linking our previously distinct borderlands. In that summer of 2018, when I came upon the Croce dei Barconi in Sicily, the Italian interior minister and far-right leader, Matteo Salvini, was turning away charity ships that had rescued refugees fleeing East and Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in that case, Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Cameroon. As it turns out, that same year, migrants from these same countries were arriving in Tijuana. The Mexican border city for years had been a key destination for migrants from Central America, Asia, and more recently, Haiti. But now smuggling routes are connecting crises in East Africa with Tijuana as well. One single report of one person's narrative provides us an example of Mesfin Tasfaldet, who had to flee Eritrea in 2017 after speaking out against that country's authoritarian president. After fleeing to Sudan, he saved money to fly to Brazil where he could land with a tourist visa. He then traversed Amazonian jungles and the Darien Gap in Panama and arrived in Tijuana, only to be blocked by Mexican police 400 feet from the border. By the so-called Remain in Mexico program agreed to by Presidents Trump and Lopez Obrador, refugees requesting asylum have been stranded in Mexican border cities. Yet having come so far and having seen so many die en route, Tesfaldet told the reporter, quote, 
We can't give up. We don't have an option. This border regime dividing North and South, wealth and poverty, is larger than our own regional histories now. For so many, there is no option, no return. Among those who I saw from a distance encamped along the Tijuana River, it turned out that dozens there were Eritreans, like Mr. Tesfaldet, trapped in Mexico, while their neighbors and perhaps their loved ones were braving the waters of the Mediterranean. In the face of this social, socially mediated catastrophe, that only seems to be expanding. Erpius and Mr. Sauper, and of course of Matar, to be witnesses, to document, analyze, and obstinately remember and teach in the same in the face of so much silencing. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Everybody's requesting in the chat uh, where they can find this piece that you've written. So it sounds oh. like there's a link there, and I want to offer it to you. Sure. Also. You can yeah. Separately, but we'd be happy to publish it also in Migrants of the Mediterranean. That would be great. Yeah. I, would Ryan, love to. Uh, I, I got a frozen screen just for a sec. Can you repeat the last paragraph of your remarks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, did everyone miss that? <laughs> um, I can repeat it, I guess. Yeah. So this border regime dividing North and South wealth and poverty is larger than our regional histories now. Uh, for so many, there is no option and no return. Among those who I saw encamped uh, from a distance along the Tijuana River, it turned out that dozens were Eritreans like Mr. Tesvaldet trapped in Mexico while their neighbors and perhaps their loved ones braved the waters of the Mediterranean. In the face of this socially mediated catastrophe that only seems to be expanding, may the humanities follow the examples of Elia de Joy and his migrant cross, and his Kirpius and Mr. Sauper, and of course Matar, to be witnesses to document and analyze and obstinately remember and teach in the face of so much silence. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I wanted the recording to have it for posterity. Okay. Did it, it cut off? Yeah. I was just. Um, so uh, a lot of people have been really inspired by our speakers today. Uh, and um, they want to know how they can find out more about you. And I don't have an easy answer for that. Uh, Hubert, well, Ryan, I know he's my colleague. So if you contact me or Ryan, That's you can get Ryan. Easy to find, yeah. Pam has a website. Is that correct, Pam? Yes. And I've been adding that to the chat. And I'm going to add it once more again here. So everybody has in front of them where we are on migrantsofthemed.com. Um, you can also follow along on the podcast that we have called Open Encounters, which is goes beyond just the written stories, but also you'll get to hear the voices of the people who we profile. So Matara is here with us today, but there are scores of others who you'll get to hear also on Open Encounters. And then, of course, we're on all of the usual social media channels. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, follow along. The most important thing is that you see the work and should help us shed more light on it. You know, this is about Matar and uh, and the others in that community who are so frequently just not seen and heard. So uh, please follow us and um, here it is now. Here's everything for you one more time. That's uh, Open Encounters on Apple and on Spotify. You can get it wherever you podcast. And um, yeah, the website and our social media. So we'll look for you there. And Hubert, um, one guest wanted to know how they can see your films if they live in Sweden. Well, I, I you know, I'm making films, uh, not distributing them, but they are usually in cinemas. But now, as there are no cinemas, um, they are streaming. I guess uh, there's a uh, Epicentro is streaming. I'm, I'm sure in the U.S. That's for sure. It's on Kino now. It's on uh, Kino, yes. the distributor. Kino now. Is, um, on Amazon and all these bullshit out outlets, anyway. Uh, um, uh, and you pay a few dollars, and uh, you see it. Um, I think uh, Darwin's Nightmare is um, at this point only on DVD because they're just negotiating rights. I think you can buy a DVD. It's a bit out fashion, but. Um, and we come as friends is um, also on some 
platform. I mean, I, 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 I to be honest, I, I, I don't know, but I, I, to to good friends, I send out links sometimes, you know, but, uh, but uh, they are sold. The, the movies are out there. So um, what you cannot see is Kisangani Diary. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to just finish that. Uh, Kisangani Diary is a 45-minute film that I've been talking about, and it's it is so terrifying that it's almost impossible to see without uh, being embedded in, in a debate and kind of explanation of the context in it. It's uh, uh, everyone who sees this movie tells me the same thing that they had never in life seen anything as bad. It Never. usually yeah, ends I, up with my students all in tears. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, and Gabriel, you know, uh, every every couple of years, I I, I meet your students, and uh, that's always a very beautiful thing. I I, I want to greet uh, friends from CU Denver. <laughs> Keep Thanks, you as a speaker. And uh, I look forward to the next time to be there, unmasked. So we have we have a little time. We have about ten minutes or so for um, for questions. I have one question from Salma Bahar, who um, asked Pamela and Hubert whether they think that a I'll read this a dense and contradictory psychological complexity comes when external circumstances force the migrant subject to engage with his or her liminal status. Could you could you put that in uh, some plainer language? In other words, to understand exactly what it means. Uh, what do, what? How does the experience of migration and the uh, marginal status of my migrants mm -hmm. uh, affect how they think about themselves? Oh well, I mean, I'm so glad Matar is here to talk about that and. Um, and I think this is something all of us can understand on a real basic level is that a lot of the times you, uh, what your surroundings are, have a tendency to inform how you think about yourself. So if you are in uh, captivity, say in Libya, I would say there's a feeling inside of you that you haven't got much freedom or hope, but there is a world outside if you can get to it. Um, and I think for the people who are living uh, on, on the margins in Italy, this is very much the same thing. You're told again and again that you're not a part of society. And a lot of the times you even live on the margins, you live um, in very remote towns outside of city centers. There's just not the opportunity to mix with people and encounter other people who you know, speak the native language or to work with or something like this, to go out with, socialize with. Um, and this this affects how uh, how you think of yourself as a member of society. And I would say the short answer to that is oftentimes they feel like they're not a part of it. This is what um, has been told to me by, you know, over and over again by many people in the migrant community. But um, Matar is here too. And he has he has quite a success story, actually, given um, what he does for work. And um, he does have his documents, which is not um, the case for everyone. Um, so, uh, Matar, if you'd like to add any notes about what it feels like as a Gambian in Italy who can very often be discriminated against for all sorts of reasons, one of them even being race, we would love to hear some of your thoughts and what you've seen. You might have to take yourself off mute. Yeah, um, there you go. You have to unmute yourself, Matar. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it's 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 not really easy. Like you know, when I when I get here, um, you know, part of me, you know, I believe in myself, but then you know, living here, trying to integrate with the society to be part of them, you know, you feel like you wanna be part of them. So first thing, you know, you start from zero. Like, you know, you have to, as a Gambian, you know, you have to, as an immigrant, you have to learn the language. So when I came here, that's the first thing I did, you know, to try to learn the language. And then 
But then, you know, it's very difficult because, you know, the moment here in Italy, people may, I don't know how to call it. I will say like, it's like, um, I will just say it's people are confused, you know, they are like more, you know, um, what are you doing here? You know, you know, they don't, they don't really, um, they, they are a bit confused, you know, and the thing is like, you know, what I have today, you know, I feel like that, you, you know, I deserve it, you know, because when I came here, you know, I get the possibility, the opportunity um, that they gave me to, to learn the language. I did that, but, you know, going to struggle, you know, try to settle, you know, to get the job that right now I'm working and I have settled it you know, then, you know, I have my salary, I have my house and I, I'm okay, let's say. But then, you know, as at sometimes that, you know, you, you like maybe um, today, you know, I'm not working. I want to, I want to go out. Maybe I will go to shopping to, um, to buy some things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this is the problem. This is when the problem starts, you know, because I remember just couple of days ago, like that, you know, it was Sunday that I said that today I'm going to the um, supermarket to, um, to, 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 to do some shopping. Then when I reach to the supermarket, I do the shopping, then I was going out to pay. But the problem is that when I was paying, you know, people, when they look at you, they see a bit different and, you know, they start saying some things that, you know, you know, when I say it, it's like, you know, they're just ignorant. They don't, they don't, they're confused, let's say. And Mata, the things that you're talking about when you went to go pay, what exactly did they say to you at the cash register? Like, you know, when I, you know, when you take out money to pay, you know, they start saying like that, you know, look at, you see what the government are doing. They, they took everything, they give it to them. And we are here you know, and we don't have nothing. Yeah. So they feel abandoned, you know, by yeah. their government. They're still, and they, yeah, go ahead. And, and they think that, you know, you, um, the government is like helping you instead of helping them, right. which is quite, um, which is sometimes quite different because, you know, you know, I have to work and I have to struggle from, from zero you, you know, to get my living, to pay my rent, it's not, it's not totally true that, you know, it, that is the government who paid this for me, you know, which is, so people are confused, you know, um, what the government did for me, it was during, um, when I just got here, like right. they give me, like they give me opportunity to, you know, to go to school, to learn the language, mm -hmm. but, you know, other than after this, you know, when they, they give me everything, they give me my documents. Mm -hmm. I, I was the one who have to go to site for job, you know, to look for house. Also, you know, even, you know, when I, you know, it takes me like, you know, when I have find a job here at Termoli the, in the city where I live, mm -hmm. it took me like, you know, um, six months, like, you know, imagine I have a contract to find a house, it was problem, you know, because people like, when I call people to say that, you know, hello, I'm, I'm this, this, and I'm looking for house, you know, and I have work contract, everything you ask, I will give it to you. I have document, everything. But sometimes, you know, people, they answer you, they say, you know, look, we don't, we don't rent um, a foreigner, or they say that we don't rent maybe an African. So people like they, they just, they are just they are just afraid of us, mm -hmm. which is not really easy to be um, integrated. It's really difficult for us, yeah. which makes me uh, yeah. Which more, which is also hard because you know being here, you know, it's not only making money, you know, it's also to live, you know, to to feel to feel part of the society. Mm -hmm. But it's not easy because most of the time you get hassle on this on the street you know
Thanks, Matar. Thanks, Matar, for that. Yeah. We we are uh, running out of time. We only have a minute left. I don't know if Zoom is going to cut me off or not. Anyone who needs to leave can leave, but um, I don't think it will. So we can won't. stay on. Yeah. So if our guests <laughs> yeah. are amenable, uh, I can keep going uh, for maybe another fifteen minutes. I'm free for another if, fifteen. If minutes. Hubert, if if you have time. Are there, are there some pe any people want to ask questions like uh or because i can see some some you know and you know i don't think you need to uh i don't think i need to moderate this i don't think there are any crazies on this chat so um just uh um uh, if you maybe i should figure out how how to can people unmute themselves, Pam? I'm not very good at this technical stuff. Uh, I think people could just unmute themselves and ask questions. Let's just open I this up. Can. Uh, Gabriel, Ryan, Pamela, Hubert, Matard, this has been great. Good. Okay. This has been more than better than great. Okay. Definitely. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank you. here and hearing Matar's story and seeing the others. Yeah, thank you, Matar, for sharing with us. Um, and I'm glad I have such smart and talented friends that make me look good. Matar, wishing you the best. Wishing you the best. Um, thank you, thank you too. Thank you, everyone. You know, I'm also happy to be here to say- Thank you, Matar. Um, so, hi. Yeah, my, go ahead. My name's Ilana Zilberg and um, I teach at the University of California in San Diego, right by the, the border, yeah. And um, I just wanted to say, this was a, a really um, moving and important and profound combination, <laughs> both in terms of its global reach, as well as its interdisciplinary and uh, sort of academic, personal, uh, journalistic, filmic relationship to the subject. Um, and um, I wanted to ask, because I teach a course um, called Global Borders, Communication and Conflict, which starts with the US-Mexico border, then, but then branches out from there. And I would love to be able to share this uh, recording with my students. Is it going to be available online? Yes. A lot of people are asking that, and I'm going to make sure it gets put up on the Migrants of the Mediterranean YouTube channel, and we'll probably find a place for it on the website too. So, uh, wonderful. Uh, when that's live, but we'll uh, we'll get it up. And in the meantime, uh, follow along on social media, and I'll make sure I announce it there too, so you get the heads up. Wonderful. Well, I've got all your links, and I really appreciate. Um, everything you've shared here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll also save the chat because uh, it allows me to do that. So I'll forward that to Pamela and she can put that on her website. But if no one's going to ask questions, I will. Pamela, okay. what do you see is the future of this situation of immig immigrants that are not welcome. If they're not welcome in Europe, they're not welcome here. I'm sure they're not welcome in too many other places. What do you see as the future, the consequences, et cetera? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a huge question. Um, and, you know, the truth is migration is not going to stop. Right. You know, it doesn't stop. Um, I say this line to everybody. It's the history of the world. You know, we're all here because the people before us moved to the places where we are at. So people are going to move, and um, and I think also as Ryan uh, mentioned uh, in what in in his speech um, earlier too is that this crossing in the Central Mediterranean isn't a recent thing either. This has also been happening for you know decades, centuries. Um, it's not going to stop. So it's it's up to us to learn how to live among each other. Now that sounds really pie in the sky, but I think actually the first step in doing that is actually just having an introduction to one another. You know, Matar was just talking about um, being in his small city 
and um, uh, and how people, you know, are are whispering about him in Italian, and they think that he doesn't understand. He does now, of course, since he can he can call that out. But even at an earlier stage, when people arrive in these small towns, there's no introduction. There's nobody in, for example, a small city in the south of Italy called Limatola, which is just north of Naples. There were a number of people I know are. Um, there was no introduction among the townspeople and the people who had just arrived from Nigeria or Gambia, or wherever, um, to say, hey, there's, here's the housing community here. We want you guys to come together, know who each other are. So, you know, there's some common ground, maybe actually know how to even say hello to one another. And those first days, and I'm sure Matat can speak to this also, you don't know how to even say hi in Italian. So how can you expect to connect with people if you don't even know, how, if you don't even have a common word to say hi? So having, uh, you know, having, some kind of connector there is the first stage. Having an introduction, <laughs> having some set up to say, here is the person who's around you. Uh, we need to have that, I think, in, you know, instituted in a real way, but also on an individual level. It's up to us. It is up to us to institute that into our daily practice of our lives too. Is to notice the people around us. Now it's COVID, so we're not seeing anybody. But you know, maybe you know when things start to open up again after everyone gets a shot in their arm we can, you know, start to do that, you know, make less judgment about the people who are around you, who look different from you, who sound different from you. Again, this also, I realize that this sounds uh, really idealistic, um, but one, I am idealistic, and two, you can actually affect change doing that. Um, it does start with us individually as well. So, uh, and, and of course, just to, want, just to speak once again, even to the work of migrants in the Mediterranean, that's what we do. You know, those stories there are going to be growing in perpetuity. So you can always uh, learn more about people there. And we hope, you know, my, my hope much further in the future is to scale this out. So it's not just covering the Mediterranean, but also maybe US, Mexico or the Middle East. And so then you we can have like correspondence in all of these areas to kind of like talk, putting light on the stories of the people who enter um, our countries and by really precarious, unfair uh, means. I hope that answers your question a little bit. No, that was great. Um, Salma, are you able to ask your question? No. Basically, what Salma wanted to know was, um, uh, I'll read it. Do you think that living in a host country can be an advantage and a chance to reinvent yourself? Or on the other hand, do you feel that alienation and dislocation uh, it creates some sort of identity crisis? I mean, is this, is this for me? Can I, can I speak to this? Sure, or yeah, sure, why not? Whoever, I mean, anybody can jump in, but I have I have a lot of thoughts on that. I mean, I'll, so I'll just start, please, Hubert, jump in whenever you want, if you want to, Ryan also. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a huge opportunity to reinvent yourself. I mean, I don't think anybody owes anyone an explanation if they want to be from someplace new. If they see, the, for example, I plan to live in Italy. I don't yet. But I plan to, and I feel very connected to Italian culture and society there. And I'm not Italian, but I would say that I identify quite closely with the culture there. That's up for me to decide. And just so if anybody, Matar also has a projection of himself in Europe and in Italy, he speaks the language, he knows the, he knows the culture now, the food, all of it. Um, he has every right to claim that identity. Um, you know, uh, I don't. I don't really believe in this um, like kind of purity of national boundaries. Um, you know, um, another example. There's someone who just said thank you from Poland. My uh, family ancestry is Polish, also. Um, so I have a close identification with this culture. I went to Poland for the first time a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago actually, and. Um, 
and felt and felt a kind of connection to homeland at the same time i'm vastly uh, apart from that uh, when i was there with my friend who is polish born and raised uh, you know, I would tell him about some of the traditions that we have in, our, in my family. And he kind of smiled because it's not something that anyone in Poland would actually do. So, you know, we kind of like create these ceremonies and things based on what we know about uh, the culture. But, um, uh, but all the same, I, I will always identify as Polish, even if the traditions I have probably don't match what is like true uh, Polish, you know, custom. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, anyone would be welcome. Anyone else, I'd love to hear uh, what yeah. you have to say about that Hubert too. and Ryan have also, I know personally, have lived quite some time in other countries, other continents. Ryan in Asia and Latin America and Europe. Hubert in Africa and Europe, and Latin America. Yeah, I mean, this is not, you know, like I said, a, the current border regime, <clears throat> um, I think, is based on a, a theory of predestination. And those who are behind the wall at, in the current way that power is structured in the world can talk about remaking themselves by moving. And somehow that border regime uh, and, and the current political economic order um, denies that to the vast majority, the rest, right, the population. When in fact, uh, really, um, of course, people should be able to move out of to, to out of you know in pursuit of opportunity. Uh, people should be allowed to move out of curiosity. People should be able to remake themselves in any place, and people, uh, crucially, should be able to stay. And the problem is, is that the current political and economic order also uh, pushes people from the place where they are born. And so um, it's the right to move and the right to stay. Now, Hubert, let me ask you, you your movie, um, We Come as Friends, was quite literally shot from the perspective of aerial migration. Hubert flew an ultralight aircraft of his design and build, I believe, from Lampedusa to North Africa. Is that correct? Um, yeah, well, no, from my little farm in, in, in Burgundy in France, to the Sudan. <clears throat> but, uh, but the movie is, is very much about uh, humans. It's not about, but the, uh, the vehicle was a kind of a clownish little airplane because it was the only means of transport where you could like land in military bases or in uh, Chinese oil fields where you could not ever go on land uh, or be shot, you know, <clears throat> by some militia but um one of the things that i can is kind of the side effect of uh of this uh journey with this little airplane was that when you're when you're a pilot you 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 obviously study the surface of, of the planet you you study where you can land you study where you can find the um provision uh, and <clears throat> one of the most striking things that that i experience without really having had a theory about this so is that coming from Europe to North Africa and from North Africa to Central Africa slowly following the Nile essentially is that the, there came a point where nothing no structure no road no 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 trees were ever aligned anymore. There was nothing square, nothing straight at one point in Central Africa. <clears throat> and it was a, it's, it was a gradual uh, transition from Europe, uh, obviously, where things are very, uh, you know, um, designed and, uh, and, and straight and uh, in line. <laughs> Even trees are planted in lines, like soldiers. Um, and uh, when you clo come close to the equator, it doesn't exist. So, so, so villages look like, like beehives and uh, very organic and very beautiful, by the way. So, and there, is, there was this one event, and maybe I can tell you about that, <clears throat> that really struck me that is not in the movie, by the way. <clears throat> but there are so many things in the movie. It's uh, like, uh, how much can you tell in two hours of cinema, of, uh, you know, centuries of, of, of colonialism? But uh, 
there was this one amazing, amazing little town of these, uh, you know, uh, shacks made out of, uh, of straw, round, round buildings. And there's only one square, one thing that was like, like a cube. And I saw it from the airplane and I landed in this, in this place. <clears throat> I was received a, a little bit uh, hostile because people hadn't seen uh, planes uh, except by being bombed from planes from North, North Sudanese uh, you know, military that bombed the south of Sudan. So, so now we're talking about the south of Sudan. <clears throat> so I landed there. People were afraid of the plane, and they, they thought I was I was I was an Arab because everyone who's white for them is an Arab. Um, but I, I I spent a few days, and then I, I I found out what the square thing was in this village. It was a, a shipping container. Hmm. A container. Um, and so how how does shipping container get to this place where there is no road? There's well, it's it was a remain of the civil war between North and South Sudan, <clears throat> where um, in the dry season, uh, shipping containers were used for two for two things: to ship in uh, guns, ammunition, uh, landmines by military, and also to ship in humanitarian aid. So. From the south, from Uganda, came the humanitarians with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, shipping of rice or, or food or whatever for for the poor, poor, uh, you know, victims of the uh, civil war. And this and and the, the guys who people who ran the civil war brought also shipping containers with uh, <clears throat> ammunition. And and then the civil war was over at this point. We're talking about uh, 2011. Uh, and this container remained the only kind of testimony of, 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 the, uh, of the industrial society of our planet. The shipping container is also the symbol of, of global, globalization. In a way. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's literally as square as it, can, as, as, it, as it can be. And when the civil war started again, or when, when the, let's say, the, the provisions were, were used, what, what was it used for? It was, it was used for something so terrifying. It was, it was the only place where the worrying parties could uh, imprison people that they wanted to, to lock up. Because you can't lock up people in a, in a, in a, in a straw shack. So, so the shipping container uh, became in many cases, this was one example, but in many, many of the villages in South Sudan became <clears throat> the place that is also representing like the 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 uh, Western uh, 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 culture, because because imprisonment did not exist with uh, with the New Era and the Dinka and the Maasai. There was no such thing as a prison. You know, the, the worst punishment was to be sent away, to have freedom, and to not come back home. So, uh, and obviously, people died in those containers uh, in a very short time because you know it's. Uh, 50 degrees centigrade, uh, 120 Fahrenheit, and uh, sun all day, so the people did, didn't last long. So the the container uh, now remaining in these villages are inhabited by by demons, as as the people uh, claim in uh, in the villages, and you couldn't really get close to those uh, to those things. And yeah. it's, it is metaphorically. Uh, kind of crazy because it's it is like the element, the square element from from the industrial society. Anyway, I'm just saying this because I discovered this from from my little airplane, which looks like a clown machine. <laughs> it's called Sputnik, um, and it's one of the scenes that could have been in the, in the film but uh, did not make it. And uh, but I think to to close this talk from today, which is very very beautiful, <clears throat> is uh, we have to keep looking to the root causes. Keep looking to the root causes because uh, the narrative, of course, it's very important. How 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 terrible is uh, the the road from uh, Tobruk over the Mediterranean to Lampedusa? How how many people die on the road? But why the fuck? Do they even have to run? You know, and and it, it, it sometimes it's a very simple thing. Sometimes it's because uh, 
some uh, petroleum company, petroleum company spent uh, 50 million into some militia who ended up uh, attacking a whole uh, you know, chunk of, of the East Congo or the South Sudan. And, uh, and that creates in, in within a few weeks, like uh, 700,000 refugees from this one investment. And uh, you can sometimes track it down very, very, you can pin it down. And, uh, and that is, it, it is, it is very hard to, 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 to think in these terms. But I, I saw that, uh, like he keeps seeing this uh, firsthand and I, and I do all I can to, to transform it into, into cinema. And when it is cinema, the magical thing is that, that people suddenly start to uh, <clears throat> understand something that they knew for a long time. Um, because knowing and understanding is not the same thing. Um, there's, there's different parts of our brain. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. If I smoke, I die, okay, I know. But then, you know, when you have lung cancer, you, you understand it a different way. Or if you're lucky, you have someone in your family who can show you a, a, a very nicely big colored picture of a, a rotten lung of someone else who, who died start to suddenly sh understand something that you you you, you knew before. so so it's all about it's all about i mean the challenge of our time is to uh, is, is is narrative how to how to alter narrative how to make it more sophisticated and more complete and more complex and, and to me at least uh, the, the ultimate you know tool for that is our moving and not only moving images, you know, because YouTube is also moving images, but moving images that have been thought of and translated from someone's, you know, deep thoughts and heart and uh, made into something, you know, it's called a movie and synthetic, but that uh, creates a new kind of reality, inner reality too. So, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing here talking because it's not really my thing to talk. <laughs> actually, let me cut in real quick just as a thank you for that, Hubert. I wanted to say to Matara actually uh, has to go. It's getting it's um, it's about ten o'clock at night in Italy, uh, and he has work tomorrow. So I just want all of us to just say thanks to him again for joining us. It really opened up uh, the discussion, and it's so important that he be here to actually represent himself and not just be me telling his story. So thank you so much, Matar. We'll speak soon, okay? Thank you, Matar. Thank you, Matar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And thank you to uh, my panelists for being so wonderful. I'm honored and uh, really encouraged by being around people like you and having an audience that cares. It's really a great thing.